So this is. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to give it a minute or two for folks to join. All right, 10.01 on the dot, I think we're going to get started. So good afternoon, um, good morning to anyone tuning in from the States or abroad. Uh, we'd like to thank you for joining us today for the first part of our 2021 Sustainable Finance Series, um, which we're kicking off with a discussion today around the state of play in the sustainable finance market. We're going to cover topics like the implications that that this acceleration has for corporate issuers, um, how corporate sustainability strategies can shape the investor decision-making process, and also really how to harness sustainable finance as a competitive advantage for your business. So just a couple of housekeeping keeping items before we begin. Uh, the session is being recorded and will be made available for replay following the event. Should you have a question at any point, please feel free to submit it via the Q&A function or chat function, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we will certainly do our best to answer those questions live. I'm hopeful we can get to at least a few of them. I am Emily Parlopiano, the head of programs and partnerships here at CECP's CEO Investor Forum. And what we do, for those of you who may not know us, is we work really closely with corporate executives from sustainability to investor relations, investor relations and ultimately CEOs um, on reorienting their ESG disclosures towards the long term. And what this means is really enabling them to unsilo their sustainability function um, to more fully integrate materiality into their business structure, um, their business operation, and also their future outlook as well. So part of that work involves educating the market um, through events such as this. And today, uh, with 2020 being a record year for sustainable finance, we are here to talk about an extremely timely topic. Um, just this month, you know, with the, with the new Biden administration taking office, we saw the U.S. rejoin the Paris Agreement um, just this month as well, as he does every January. Uh, we saw Larry Fink release his annual letter, this time around calling on all companies to disclose a plan for how their business model will be compatible with a net zero economy by 2050. And, I mean, to quote Larry Fink, uh, we know that climate risk is investment risk, but we also believe the climate transition presents a historic investment opportunity. So I'm delighted to field this panel today, um, and I have with me uh, Georg Kell, the chairman of Arabesque and the founder of the UN Global Compact, Nikita Singal, the co-head of sustainable investment and ESG uh, with Lazard Asset Management, and then my dear friend and colleague, Alexa Yeet, who heads up the Sustainable Finance um, Program here at the CEO Investor Forum. So before we dive into our panel questions, I'm gonna turn it over to Alexa for a brief market overview so we can level set before we dive in. Great, thanks Emily. <laughs> Thanks to all who are joining us today. We have a few different practitioners on the line. Uh, we'll be taking questions at the end um, and hopefully you find this engaging. We can always follow up following the, the webinar if any additional questions. But as Emily said, we did wanna just start off before diving into some numbers, level setting and seeing what this concept sustainable finance really looks like from a bird's eye view. And essentially it's a financial system that incentivizes long-term thinking. So when thinking about your long-term strategy, Capital allocation, especially as we transition, looking to transition to a low carbon economy, um, it's really going to be about mobilizing capital towards what matters. And what matters to companies 
is the ESG, environmental social governance material issues. So it's really a two-way street. You have investors on one side, um, they are investing in companies and funds that aim to achieve positive financial returns as well as social and impact, uh, environmental impact. And on, on the other side, you have corporates who are raising and borrowing capital that they then direct towards the development of innovative solutions and products that address their material ESG issues. So when thinking about how in the system of sustainable finance, capital is moving, it's actually all being allocated towards solving the pressing ESG issues. Um, again, such as transitioning to a low carbon economy or preparing resilient strategies to tackle nature related risks and opportunities as well. So if we could go to the next slide. So again, diving into some numbers, we've seen an incremental growth just over the past year, much of it due to COVID relief efforts, um, but the sustainable investing assets under management have reached $17.1 trillion. Um, you know, it's safe to say that it's secured its space in the mainstream, um, increasing evidence of sustainable funds outperforming or performing in line of their traditional funds like the S&P 500. Um, you also have ESG integration and restriction screening being the two most prominent ESG sustainable investing approaches that asset managers and investors, individual investors alike are using um, to really ensure that their portfolio not only aligns with their impact objectives, but also make sure that they have um, ESG integrated throughout their investing strategy. And then disclosure and management of corporate political spending and lobbying were actually the two most um, popular uh, issues raised by shareholders in the uh, shareholder proposals last year in 2020. Moving over to kind of the, the signaling the business case that corporates can signal the business case to investors, you have data disclosure and dialogue. Um, we really like to think of data as corporates setting the context and separating the value from the noise and what they're reporting on to ensure that the data that data providers are using that eventually roll up into ratings and rankings truly reflect the performance of the business across ESG issues. And that ultimately in informs the investor decision-making process as well. Then you have disclosure. Um, this is really where the corporate can own their narrative and be sure that they're in control of what's being reported out and eventually again rolling up into these uh, ratings and rankings. Um, it's important to, of course, be as transparent as possible and report on your material metrics. Um, not all metrics are going to be the same across industry. SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, does a great job at providing guidance along what is material for your industry. And then at the end, we have dialogue. Um, this is really engagement based, leading for the future through effectively communicating progress on sustainability topics and other for, for your investors, but other key stakeholders as well. We saw again, the really rise of uh, stakeholder capitalism this year, this year. And that's just, you know, not only thinking about the earnings going back to your shareholders, but also delivering value to your customers. It's about making sure that your community is also included in the conversation and that you're aware as a company of what the impact of your business has on them. And then also business ethics with your supply chain as well. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Great, so these are the numbers um, kind of summing up from a global sustainable debt issuance standpoint, how corporates are harnessing capital markets and raising the funds um, through this platform to, tar to meet and achieve their goals and commitments that they're coming out with increasingly now, especially again over the, the climate change issues that we're seeing. So global sustainable debt issuance surpassed 700 billion um, in 2020, which is amazing considering just five years ago, you can see from the graph, um, this issuance was barely on the map. Um, we saw an, an increase in social bonds this year, alongside, of course, the traditional green bonds, um, which increased 26% um, compared to 2019. And then sustainability and social bond categories each surpassed 100 billion for the first time in, compared to 2019, um, where sustainability bonds, which are actually the mix of social and green projects, um, more than tripled. Uh, seeing an increase of 106%. We uh, wanted to just cover a few examples of the bonds that were issued, the notable bonds this year with Alphabet issuing the largest sustainability slash 
green bond uh, ever issued by a company at 5.75 billion. Uh, that was back in August. Then you have Allstate, uh, which was the first corporate bond offering um, that was managed exclusively by minority women and veteran owned business enterprises. And then Ford was the first foundation to issue a social bond uh, back in June to support social justice, human services and art uh, and arts organizations that were affected by COVID. Um, so separate from the bonds, you also have a rise in sustainability linked uh, loans, so syndicated loans or revolving credit facilities um, that were put together not to track, you know, specific ESG related projects. So the capital, you know, can be allocated to general corporate working uh, purposes, but you can also um, with sustainable sustainability linked bond uh, loans, these proceeds are tracked against a specific metric. So if you have a target that you're trying to achieve, such an, as a sustainability, uh, sustainable development goal, your proceeds are actually going to be reflecting how close you are to meeting that goal. And the interest rates of the loans actually go upward or downward, depending on how, um, again, how you're performing across that metric. Um, so that's just in another way for companies to engage. So I'll kind of pause there. Um, again, we've seen, it, it's definitely a, a case of maturity for the bond space over the past year alone. Um, something that's been climbing over the past five years. And we expect uh, the bonds to continue increasing, especially as the COVID relief efforts continue and climate change takes center stage for a lot of corporate material issues. So I'll pause Thank there you. and hand it back to you, Emily, for the panel. Thank you, Alexa. Those numbers are um, certainly clear um, and compelling. They're, they're telling a very, very exciting story for our future. Um, and I think we can all agree that we are you know, on the edge of a fundamental reshaping um, of finance. So, you know, with that, this, this space is really accelerating. Um, and I'd love to hear from each of you. I'm going to start with Nikita, but um, what do you see as the top growth driver in its uptake and impact? Yeah, um, good morning, everyone. And thanks, Emily, I think that's a, a very um, good question to start with because it has indeed been quite a, a remarkable uh, pace of acceleration in the last few years. And as Alexa was saying, you know, uh, fund flows into this field, whether it's ESG integrated or sustainability strategies or impact strategies has just um, had a, a parabolic rise. Um, and so I think so there are four kind of primary drivers for that. Uh, most notably, which I think is probably the most financially material ESG issue uh, is that of climate change. And I think on one hand, there has been uh, significant recognition now of the physical risks of climate change as we are seeing increasing hurricanes and floods. And it's starting to become more evident that uh, most of these uh, climactic events are happening at a much faster pace than they did in the history of, of human civilization. And that, that uh, those risks are largely unpriced in the financial markets. So as an example, actually now there is a network of um, of, of banks uh, around the world, which is um, uh, central banks that have started to for that have formed the network for greening the financial system. And um, it was um, finally the, the Federal Reserve has also joined that consortium to really think about and start to view climate as a systemic risk to the financial system. So I think that has been a major driver. Uh, the second is sort of linked to that is regulation and regulation around the world, but particularly in Europe, we are starting to see that that is driving changes in corporate ESG disclosure, their behavior, um, how we structure and design products on the asset management side. So for example, this is the, uh, the green, uh, you know, EU taxonomy and the green bond uh, taxonomy, as well as thinking about how, uh, how indices are structured. And all of this is likely to have an impact ultimately on the cost of capital of businesses. So that's another driver. Uh, the third one is asset owners. Uh, and, and what we are seeing is that uh, systemic risks linked to ESG are of particular concern to universal owners, such as large pension funds. So pension funds are increasingly embedding ESG and specifically climate change into their asset allocation and their investment decision making. And you're also starting to see uh, greater levels of asset owner collaboration, which is adding momentum to this effort. So you have the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, uh, which is now um, 
about $5 trillion in AUM focused on trying to get the capital uh, that they manage to be aligned with the Paris Agreement by 2050 or uh, to be net zero by 2050 and thereby be aligned. Uh, and you're also seeing collaboration on engagement with corporates. And so that uh, there are organizations like the Climate Action 100 that Black, BlackRock um, is a significant supporter of. Um, and so you're seeing all of these organizations start to put pressure on everyone in the value chain from the asset managers, uh, the, the, you know, the uh, vendors and, and intermediaries all the way down uh, through to, to corporates that we're actually buying in our portfolios. Um, and the last driver, I would say, uh, certainly not the least, uh, perhaps the most important, uh, and I think they are the you know, units of, of change in the economy, uh, is, is businesses. And the business community is responding by coalescing around this concept of stakeholder capitalism, as you described, Alexa. So this multi-stakeholder approach to long-term value creation is starting to gain traction, and companies are also starting to align um, executive compensation and incentives with achieving sustainability goals. So we saw uh, the tone set on the top by the business roundtable, but then we've also seen significant commitments by all sorts of companies, including oil and gas companies like a Canadian Natural Resources or a Repsol, Equinor, uh, European oil and gas companies that have announced targets uh, for, for decarbonization to be aligned with the Paris Agreement. Uh, so all of this, I would kind of say, is I would sum it up as it's resulting in a fundamental shift in corporate behavior and companies. It's not no longer just about PR or CSR reports. Um, it's much more about how does this fundamentally impact business models and capital allocation. That's great. Thank you for that, Nikita. Georg, I'd love to hear your perspective. Thank you and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Nikita laid it out beautifully. I just want to add a few angles to this uh, description I fully subscribe to. Uh, historically, I think business was ahead of finance in uh, integrating externalities and uh, trying to come to grips with uh, changing contexts and environments. Uh, business used to be ahead. Finance has been switching on now and finance is really accelerating rapidly and probably now almost taking a lead in this. Uh, so we have a new, uh, a new coherence in the marketplace between finance and business, which was not the case just a few years ago when many CEOs would complain that uh, our investment relations, uh, our capital markets don't reward. Actually, they punish our sustainability investments because they don't have an immediate short-term return. Uh, this is shifting now rapidly, and that's a big breakthrough, a massive systemic breakthrough. I Allow me to say, I had uh, published a book on this called, uh, just recently co-edited, Sustainable Investing, which uh, just elaborates on that theme of the coherence between finance and business, which is emerging. Behind it, I would argue, and I fully agree with Nikita, is, is a big systemic worldview change. It's not just that one segment of society is changing, it's a societal change. It's part of human progression. It's part of our evolution. We now realize that what we used to view as externality actually matters and we have to deal with it. So uh, it is a systemic uh, alignment. And I would just add one key driver. We have the regulators, we have the markets, business, finance, consumers, society, but behind it is also another force and that's technology. Many of the solutions which we see now and where capital is shifting to are actually technology driven. Technology itself enables the transparency of the factors that are not part of the classic uh, cost benefit analysis and we can now assess their relevance. So technology is a, a truly empowering systemic force behind all of this. Energy transformation uh, is one example, which basically is about climate change. Energy uh, accounts for 80% of greenhouse gas emissions. The breakthroughs are now possible largely because of technological progress in renewable energy and smart grids and so forth. So the role of technology in all of this is fundamental. Uh, corporates know that uh, technology is the biggest disruptor, but it also empowers on the sustainability front, uh, the measurement, it empowers uh, the interaction and it offers solutions for the problems at hand. 
So I would only add technology as a systemic force in this uh, wonderful menu. But otherwise, I fully agree with Nikita. Absolutely. We've definitely seen that technology can sort of stand as that great equalizer. And so I'm, I'm excited to dive in a little bit later, um, Georg, into the work at Arabesque. Um, but Alexa, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, sure. You know, they, they've highlighted the drivers uh, very succinctly and, and hit each of the important ones. Um, perhaps a more, a more obvious one would definitely be that investors have realized that they can utilize the power of capital to alter unsustainable corporate behavior um, to help, you know, resolve a lot of these pressing ESG issues. So while you, on one side, again, you have the investors that are altering sustainable corporate behavior by the way they allocate their investments, you have corporates that are investing internally as well. It's not just about investing in the products and solutions. And of course, that's extremely important, especially with the innovative technologies um, that will require an extreme amount of financing to get to where these commitments are projecting we need to be. Um, but then you also have the investment that needs to happen internally for your employees, for your supply chain changes. Um, you know, how much is your business reliant on nature resources um, that we're, you know, approaching a scarcity of. So it's thinking about your long-term strategy and thinking through the future, looking around the corner. That's what investors really want to see. And if they don't necessarily align with that, they will actively engage um, through dialogue, through their voting rights um, to ensure that you hear their voice and that their voice is reflected in your business. If not, unfortunately, that, that investment access um, will be cut short. Um, sorry, there was one more I wanted to mention, is uh, corporates and their seat at the table when it comes to public policy. We're going to see a lot of that now that with the Biden administration um, and the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, companies have a critical role to play in public policy, especially in the US, um, where that's just at the seed stage, if you will. Um, you have companies like Total Petroleum um, that actually removed itself from the American Petroleum Institute. So shifts like this, um, where you're seeing corporates take a stand for what aligns with their values and what doesn't is what I believe we'll see much more of in the coming two to five years. That's great. And, and taking a step back and thinking about something that Georg said around, you know, finance sort of taking the lead over business. Um, Nikita, I'd love, I think it might be interesting for folks to hear, you know, a bit on the evolution of Lazard's sustainable investing strategy. So if you could speak, you know, briefly to some of the changes that you've seen over the last few years and really what that means um, for the market. Sure. Um, so Lazard has had a long history of ESG integration, um, having been, you know, having formalized it into the into our process in some strategies like our emerging market strategies almost 20 years ago. And, and we published our first ESG policy 10 years ago and have had an integrated approach. Uh, but based on, you know, what we've all just been sharing today, um, it's it's been a pretty significant change in, um, in really kind of... Um, deepening that level of integration across all of our strategies and across all of uh, across the asset classes as well. I think a lot of this has to do with uh, just, you know, keeping a listening ear to what our clients are asking for. And when you think about, um, you know, and a global manager like, like Lazard, we have clients all over the world and, and just, it's, it's been an interesting, um, uh, journey in the last several years to hear what our clients in not just in Europe, but in Japan, Australia, the MENA region, Canada, and as well as the US and South America are increasingly asking about, you know, about sustainability. Uh, give you really two kind of quick examples. Uh, there's a $10 billion Scandinavian client that decided to convert 50% of its AUM to be sustainable by this year. And, and we've partnered with them to launch a US and a global sustainable strategy. Similarly, there's a $30 billion Australian superannuation fund that has put in place a climate transition plan, uh, which regardless of the managers and what their titles are, whether they're ESG integrated or have nothing to do with ESG, all of those managers are put on a carbon budget and they are required to be aligned with, with the Paris Climate Agreement. So there's some pretty ambitious uh, decisions that are being made at the asset owner and end client levels that are impacting asset managers like us and also giving us the confidence that 
we need to, we can you know increasingly commit resources and strive to be kind of best in class in this space. Uh, specifically to Lazard, the way um, I have thought about our strat our ESG strategy is really kind of on three prongs, and and I think I would su suggest that I think these are ways to think about having a genuine approach to ESG because there's so much uh, that you can do in a box ticking way. Uh, one is recognizing that ESG is about collective responsibility. So rather than it being uh, resting on the shoulders of one person or a small ESG team, uh, ESG really needs to be embedded across the entire firm, across all the key functional uh, you know, areas of the business from certainly from research and portfolio management, but all the way through to risk, compliance and legal um, you know, reporting and, and the technology function being a really important one. So really trying to embed ESG across these functions is quite important if you want to genuinely tie business to financial material, uh, tie ESG to financial materiality. Uh, the second one is impactful ownership and recognizing that, um, you know, stewardship is, is part of our fiduciary responsibility. Um, we think that that includes, um, you know, it does include launching specific strategies that cater to specific uh, environmental or social objectives, but equally it is about engaging with companies and trying to advocate for improved uh, metrics when it comes to financially relevant ESG issues. Uh, so that's a, been a big area of focus at Lazard, and I would argue for you know any organization that is taking this seriously. It is about uh, recognizing the financially material ESG risks and opportunities, and then engaging on companies to actually improve behavior. Because if you're, you know, you're only, and this is a, you know, personal view, especially if if you just decide to to divest from a company, you perhaps could have much greater impact if you had stayed in, engaged, and pushed for better behavior. So there are different tools that you can employ, but I think we should uh, never underestimate the power of positive engagement and helping companies recognize the value of making these changes and how it might impact actually their long-term uh, their long-term financial value. Uh, and the last one, uh, last point. So I talked about a collective responsibility, impactful ownership, and then the last point is about continuous innovation. And it is uh, really a commitment where it doesn't matter how long you have done ESG. It doesn't matter if you know how many seminal organizations you're signed up to. Um, but what matters is your commitment to continuous innovation and having best-in-class data, analytics, uh, learning to combine fundamental and quant skill sets because it is still a relatively nascent space uh, relative to the history of financial markets. So being able to have that kind of innovative analytics so you can have unique insights in the marketplace is, is an important commitment for Lazard as well. That's really great. Thank you, Nikita. And I think something that stood out to me was that um, ESG as a collective responsibility and something that really comes to mind is is the increased transparency in the space. And so um, if you're open to sharing, you know, as, as an asset manager um, represented here today, it would be great to hear, you know, how you prioritize um, the different ESG data sets um, that you have access to, uh, to really integrate into your investment decision-making process. I think it might be helpful for some folks on the line to, to have some insight there. Sure, and and I'll try to be uh, succinct because you know I think uh, Georg and I could spend um, a few days, if not a couple hours, uh, lamenting about the the challenges with with data. Um, but um, I think I would recommend for everyone present here, if you haven't read, there's a really good academic paper by Professor George Serafim at Harvard Business School. I know he's spoken at that CEO Investor Forum before. Um, uh, it's a it's a paper called Four Things No One Tells You About ESG Data. Um, and if I can quickly kind of summarize, you know, there is raw company data and then there are ratings, which are basically often end up being subjective assessments of that data. Now, especially because of the, the state of, of ESG data, which is uh, there's a great deal of variety and inconsistency in data. Uh, there is a deluge of data because, you know, uh, even in a metric like scope one uh, carbon emissions, it's maybe 70% of, of the market is uh, has as proper disclosure. And so any data provider that says they have 90% plus coverage 
what they're essentially doing is imputing that data based on a number of assumptions that can often be erroneous. And so we have to be quite careful about uh, relying or, or, or having ESG decisions depend on external ESG ratings companies. Uh, two of the largest ESG ratings companies have correlations in their scores of 0.3 to 0.5. Uh, if you look at the correlations of the scores of the S&P and Moody's bond rating, that's closer to 0.8 to 0.9. So it just shows you, you know, how, how early on we are in this marketplace and we cannot rely on just, you know, third party ESG ratings companies. Um, the I won't go into the detail for why, but very quickly, it's really because of the imputation techniques, the, the benchmarking decisions that, that these ratings companies are making. So it is for good reason, but we have to be conscious of that and be more focused on um, both as corporates and as asset managers on really what are the real world outcomes and how are these issues getting priced into the market? What are the catalysts that are driving a carbon emissions to actually impact the bottom line of a company? or certain ESG practices to actually impact the organic revenue growth rate or the margin assumptions or general volatility and cash flows of a company. That, that kind of becomes paramount. Um, so I, I'm sure Gior can talk a lot more about this um, from Arabesca's perspective, but I would just kind of underscore uh, the need uh, that uh, on the corporate side, uh, just uh, in, in your language, Alexa, I, I really like that is companies need to take control of the ESG data nat narrative and focus on proactively shaping disclosure instead of being overwhelmed by all the surveys by external ESG ratings companies. Uh, in my view, and this is why I've been a long-term supporter of the CEO Investor Forum, it is about having long-term strategic plans because this kind of forced um, you know, short-termism in the marketplace across capital markets from corporates to, to asset owners is resulting in, in, in um, you know, trade requirements for trade-offs between ESG and other investment decisions. Um, and the minute you lengthen your time horizon, a lot of uh, stakeholder concerns, like how you treat your employees, uh, how you invest in not uh, you know, creating significant negative externalities in the environment, actually become intrinsic to your you know long-term financial performance so i think those would be my kind of two ways to get over the the uh the challenges that we have today in the esg uh the data landscape i would just add um or or rather pose a follow-up to you nikita in in thinking about again the two most prominent sustainable investing strategies has traditionally been esg integration which you spoke about and also restriction or exclusionary um screening those are more passive, if you will, and it seems that the market's moving or investors, asset managers are moving more towards the, the proactive thematic or impact investing where they can explicitly seek um, impact through their, their investments. Would you say that's something Lazard um, has looked into? Is that something integrated into your strategy today? So I, I largely agree with what you shared, Alexa, with the one kind of um, caveat is I don't think ESG integration can be done well passively, um, you know, it's starting to get better on the quant side because the data is improving and, and managers who can marry fundamental insights and, you know, use that to have improved quantitative insights are get are, are being able to manage, you know, ES, do ESG integration well. Uh, in my mind, ESG integration is, is uh, for, for better or for worse, it emerged out of the space of socially responsible investing. You know, back in the day when, uh, as, as a society, we were reacting to the Vietnam War, we were reacting to apartheid in South Africa. We were also, uh, you know, constructing strategies that were based on faith-based investors who wanted us to exclude certain quote-unquote sin stocks. But where ESG is today is about integrating material, environmental, social governance, risks and opportunities. And it is very difficult to integrate that genuinely if you're just relying on uh, an exclusionary screen or on third party data sets. So being able to derive insights from raw company disclosure and also have a forward looking view rather than a backward looking view of companies. Um, it, it, I would argue that it almost cannot be done passively. Uh, and just very quickly to your question about, you know, sustainability and impact strategies, we're certainly see, seeing that gain traction. Uh, it's one of the reasons why um, we at, at Lazard launched our U.S. and global sustainable strategies, as well as a strategy called our Minerva Global Gender Diversity Strategy, which is focused on investing in companies that empower women all across the, not just at the board level and the executive leadership, but all through the organization. 
I would argue that uh, launching these products, one has to be extremely careful about uh, because if the goal is uh, is a non-pecuniary thing to use the Department of Labor language, um, uh, not that I'm I'm supportive of, of that ruling, that, that proposed ruling that came out and Lazard actually issued a comment letter why we thought it was fraught with, with issues. Uh, but I think that you have to marry or construct these strategies with a risk return objective in mind. And also it becomes one of the more reasons why the impact in these strategies is sustainable because it's tied to business rationale. So in the case of our Min Minerva gender diversity strategy, uh, the reason we're doing that is because of a fundamental belief that improved gender diversity increases cognitive diversity. And there are numerous uh, academic studies now showing how improved diversity results in better long-term ROA and ROE for companies. And same thing for our sustainability strategies. There is an underlying investment-led belief that there is a once-in-a-generational shift to a more sustainable uh, future, which will, re which will result in changing regulation, changes in consumer behavior and technological disruptions, all of which create the prime catalyst for companies that are sustainable to outperform companies that aren't. And that investment-led belief is kind of what's driving the, the creation of those strategies. Excellent, that makes sense, thank you. Thanks, Nikita. And I know um, Georg has has quite um, a few opinions and thoughts on this topic as well, specifically because Arabesque is is turning into you know this incredible progressive technology focused ESG organization. Um, and so I'd love to hear from you, Georg. You know, to what extent do you see AI sort of carrying forward ESG? Yeah, first let me build on what Nikita said. I, I really underwrite everything she said, uh, and it's really important for, the, for everybody who listens in here to realize that we have to really go for, for the raw data, we have to go for the content, and less and less play uh, outside games and run after it. And the good news, I believe, and Nikita, we should continue that definitely, <laughs> that discussion. I think the trend is going there very slowly, but there is more coherence emerging in the landscape uh, with the Biden administration now, the EU regulation. We, we may see some major steps forward there, including on the minimum floor requirements as one, one uh, angle. Uh, and then the other big development is indeed technology. There is increased capability to interpret much smarter raw data and to blend it with, with fundamental analysis. And that's a, a leapfrogging is happening in that space. And that is a, a very positive development because it allows uh, solutions for, for specific applications that were unthinkable just two, three years ago, bespoke solutions, thematic solutions um, that uh, were not possible. I just give one example. We have one new tool, which is the temperature score, which is very easy to apply. And it allows, based on raw data, the assessment of investments, whether or not uh, corporations that are in the portfolios are on a 1.5, 2 degree, or 3 degree uh, pathway. And that is, I think, one of the next evolutions in that space is to make raw data applicable in a simple way. That is one uh, helpful way forward. Uh, the other big trend on AI itself, it's a fundamentally disruptive force ahead of us. Uh, the founder and CEO of Arabesque, a visionary uh, senior former banker from Barclays, Omar Selim, he has convinced me long ago that finance is going now from passive to AI. It used to go from active to passive, now it's going to AI and it's starting and it's covering all domains and the big battle now is to make sure that AI integrates and fully accounts also for the ESG uh, analysis. And that's why ESG data matters. And it matters how companies disclose and what they disclose, because it's the quality of that information which then shapes the holistic approach. So I think there's a major, major disruption ahead in terms of two dimensions, actually. One purely driven by technology, AI will disrupt finance in a fundamental way, portfolio construction and management uh, and much more. And the other one is how AI carries forward the ESG information. That is my concern. And uh, that's where uh, Arabesque is kind of leading, I may say, uh, bringing the two together. Uh, the data side is still work in progress. 
like many others, we are now relying on our own data, on raw data, and we make a point out of it. We still aggregate others as well, obviously, but the key is increasingly raw data and also winning over the corporates to invest in the real content and rather than playing third party games and looking in the back uh, rear uh, mirror. And that means for the corporates, I'm very convinced is to invest in your own data infrastructure. And again, that's where technology now opens up many new opportunities, make it much easier to integrate ESG analysis as you do with financial analysis in your supply chain with your, uh, and uh, throughout your value chain. Uh, there's a new project in the pipeline we are promoting very much along these lines. It's called something like a company book, uh, but I, I have no doubt that this is one of the next big trends where corporates now uh, are realizing it matters uh, what we put out in the market and we have to control uh, not being run by the market. So I think it's very exciting, these overlaps of, of technology, in particular AI, together with the evolution on the data side, which continues to improve in small incremental steps, but not unimportant. And the figures you gave us before are presumably are for the US market, but we have to keep in mind, we're talking really about a global universal trend as Nikita outlined. And it's also interesting to see that in some markets, some of the dynamic interpretations of materiality vary quite significantly from other markets. So there will continuously be a need to be adaptable and flexible and uh, uh, go with, with relevant context uh, changes in particular regions and markets. It's a very dynamic world. It's a very uh, multifaceted, but the underlying big drivers are universal in scope and in applications. So the direction of the pathway is very clear. And I would also agree that uh, decarbonization is clearly on the top of the list. I think actually we are already in a new era where uh, negative carbon is <laughs> the new currency, if you so want. Uh, it, it is coming and it has to come. And this is now being priced into, into assets increasingly, both on the positive and on the negative side. So this would be my, my front runner. But then we always are reminded uh, the social issues are always important, will always remain important here in the US. We have just seen it again, how diversity now finally is uh, hitting the boardrooms and seen as a, as a mega trend and as a driver that is not just a, a short wave of, of uh, emotions, but it's, it's here to stay. And that plays out elsewhere too. So it's a positive development where finance increasingly now has the tools and the means to be part of the solution. And uh, as we see the alignment between politics, business and finance, I think we will witness a much even further acceleration of these trends. It will become the new normal. And uh, a final thought on that is uh, in the mindset, you can think about sustainability from many angles, but in the end, it's a transient phenomena, if you so want, because it basically shows you that the actual efficient market hypothesis has some shortcomings and ESG is helping to bridge that. But the moment price signals fully integrate the risks and the opportunities in the new understanding, then ESG may well disappear as a add-on driver. It will be normalized throughout the valuations. To that point, Georg, uh, we often say in the sustainability space as well that if we do our jobs correctly, we might be out of a job in just five right. years or so because it'll be so integrated, as Nikita said, across every business function. Um, of course, the board is getting more involved with board oversight, setting the context for what sustainability strategies should look like um, and include. Uh, I did want to touch on something you said earlier, which was, you know, seeing seeing um, investment in AI or kind of quantifying some of these ESG metrics as an investment. And I think a lot of times companies typically see this as an expense, um, but it does have a long-term value. And uh, on the CCP side, we often see companies building the business case to internal stakeholders of why they should invest in, um, whether it be you know the future of work, AI solutions, um, technology, um, innovative products that are that have a sustainable um, alignment with their objectives. We see this, you know, trying to establish that business case for 
it as research and development um, as you would invest in R&D. This is kind of to be thought of as the new R&D, if not. I would even go a step further. I would argue it's increasingly a necessary precondition to get your house in order and your mm -hmm. infrastructure up and running. Uh, if you don't have it, you will face increasingly costs in, in playing many different games. Uh, you will have transaction costs without a clear benefit. Uh, you're not in charge of the agenda. Others are driving it for you. You, you may be, they may be right, they may be wrong. You have no way of influencing it. Uh, it's much more uh, reasonable and it's the right strategy to shape your own future. And th this comes back then to the bigger change agenda to corporate level part of strategy, part of CEO leadership, boards have to fully comprehend and understand. And ultimately that means integration. It means the old one absorbs something new and becomes something new. And this is the process we're in. Uh, corporate sustainability used to be the domain of external relations and communications. Now it's an issue of boards. Uh, and the question is, are boards up to the job and uh, do they have the right people to, to think in horizontal terms? <laughs> CEOs increasingly uh, uh, appropriate this agenda and rightly so. They discover the discussion on purpose is a way to readjust their own branding and their own standing in society because they want to make a shift from the old to the new. And that's why this purpose notion also plays in and is a helpful tool for many CEOs to make that shift happen. So we are moving in that right direction. Uh, and uh, I, I have no doubt that this will become the new normal. I think you're right about that, George. You've um, expressed uh, talking about this time in history as a new era. And I think that's completely spot on, you know, moving towards this technological revolution and really just compelling companies to take ownership of their ESG data is really something that we need to keep hammering home uh, because they, they do have control to that extent um, and investing heavily in that internally is going to benefit them um, down the line as well. So I've seen that we have a few questions that have come in from the q and I'd love to hop over to that if you guys are okay with sort of skipping some of the things that we were hoping to touch on. I'd love to um, ask a few of these. So we'll start at the top. Uh, Stephen Barrett asked, you know, he said, hi, these numbers are very interesting. Can I ask, are credit ratings impacted by sustainability factors? Anyone want to take that one? I'll, Alexa? I'll this off. Yeah. So especially, you know, with the sustainability bonds, et cetera, you see a lot of, um, you have Moody's and S&P coming out with different credit rating products. Um, you have Moody's that just came out with their issuer profile, and they also issue a credit rating um, for, for not only the issuer, but the product that the issuer is serving like a sustainability bond, for instance. So when you look at these ratings, it's no longer about the, the rating reflecting credit, uh, uh, um, sorry, uh, ability of default in the future. It's also about thinking ahead and what is the future outlook of this business? What is the ESG story telling me today for me to have a projection of where this business and where my investment's gonna go in the future. So credit ratings play a critical role in getting a synopsis of company performance to that date, and then using that credit rating to kind of inform your projections over the future. Um, there is in sustainability bond space, um, credit ratings that are coming from companies like Sustainalytics, Visual Iris, um, these bonds you know, do come at a premium price in terms of working with a third party, second party opinion. Um, and we help to navigate that ecosystem of who's involved in such a transaction. Um, you do have the credit rating um, that sets, you know, that the transaction's informed by the credit rating of the actual company itself. But then you have the second party opinion, which will tell you whether the transaction um, is one that is um, looking positive or not. Yeah, there are first uh, even uh, academic studies out already, which uh, bring the evidence how uh, sustainability is starting to affect credit rating. Uh, and maybe in your next slide, we do you do next time in the next round, we will have sufficient empirical evidence to give concrete figures. Clearly, it's it's happening, but maybe with a delay factor, not as uh, wasn't in the first round, but it's picking up uh, as we speak. 
there's also you know a, a such a focus on what your rating and ranking is coming from these you know more not grassroots but you know you have your moody's and smps but you also have your sustain analytics and visualize there's a proliferation if you will of um credit rating agencies that take form from a data provider itself um, what we like to underscore at ccp uh, is to pay attention to the performance. Don't get overwhelmed uh, by all these ratings and rankings. You're likely not to find alignment or mapping between the, the five of them that you're looking at. Um, we try to demystify what the methodologies are that, that accumulate to that rating or that score. Um, however, you know, at, at bare bones, when you look at it, they're all assessing you. They should be by your material issues. So if you take a step back and make sure that you have a tight strategy to address those issues, you can more so understand where your rank, rating or ranking is going to land. Um, so it's kind of that preemptive, preemptive looking at how can I control again that narrative and make sure that the rating falls where I can kind of control where it does. Thank you for that, yeah. Stephen. I hope that answered your question. Um, we're going to hop to the next one. Angela asked, based on your experience, I'm interested to hear how you assess broader governance and risk oversight, including environmental and social issues and stakeholder consideration at publicly listed companies versus private unlisted alternative investment opportunities. Obviously, some of this goes back to data availability. Um, Nikita, would you like to take that one? Yeah, um, I mean, I, you know, having always been an investor investment professional first and a sustainability professional second, not because I care less about sustainability, but because I genuinely think that's how you achieve long-term sustainable impact, uh, you know, is by, by tying it to long-term financial outcomes. Um, I think that, um, you know, um, in the case of private companies in particular, where ESG disclosure is even more sparse, I think it is thinking about, and, and even in the case of public companies where you might have a deluge of data, you have to go back to fundamentals of assessing companies and understanding um, where does a company sit in an industry and in what is the industry roadmap like that is going to impact that company's product or service? How does it impact its ability to remain competitive, to maintain a certain growth rate, uh, to be able to up, you know, um, uphold certain margins? Uh, is increased competition likely to impact, put margin pressure or reduce growth? Is there a disruptive technology in the industry? Um, and I'm kind of speaking a bit more abstract, but to give you more specific examples, my point kind of is that the materiality of ESG issues is highly contextual. And so, if you happen to be in the healthcare industry, whether a private or a public company, you have to be thinking, especially in the US, about issues like uh, drug affordability and, and that impacting drug pricing and your and ultimately your margins. Uh, or you have to be thinking about how are you maintaining the most kind of one of the risks for a business in the healthcare industry is uh, by naturally being a uh, products that are ingested or inside our body, there are liabilities that can come. So the customer concern of providing, you know, safe products is very high. And you as a business being able to demonstrate that you have the risk practices in place to ensure that you're putting out safe products out there and that you have practices to mitigate these risks as well is important. So on our end, just to give you a flavor, if you are a healthcare company, uh, our healthcare analyst is accessing, yes, the disclosures that are available and your you know, 10Ks and reading through the MDNAs and the risk sections. But what he's also doing is look, leveraging tools like natural language processing. And, and at some point, this will you know, be full AI. Uh, perhaps Georg can comment on that. But you, we, we're doing things, uh, trying to do innovative things like scanning FDA warning letters to see which companies might actually provide the early signs of product liability concerns. And that for us is a sign that this is a potential risk on this company's balance sheet, or maybe even impacting its top line. Uh, if that's in the healthcare space, if you are in the energy space, if you are a utility, uh, you're grappling with a very different set of ESG issues. So you have to be worrying about what is the energy mix of your of your um, you know of your power uh, distribution? Um, is there renewable energy, and how do you make sure that you have the right balance? Or first of all, are you regulated or unregulated utility? Uh, and really, kind of marrying those fundamental insights and are uh, going back to you know I almost think of like Porter's five forces and thinking about how 
are the forces of ESG likely to then get priced into your business and impact your, your strategy and your capital allocation decisions. And being able to articulate that is far more important than having you know, a lengthy um, uh, disclosure. Uh, so one thing I would kind of go back to of all the organizations that, have, that are out there, um, I have followed the journey of SASB for a long time back you know, from tw in 20. 12 uh, when, when I was at the when I was at the Heron Foundation and the Heron Foundation was one of the you know earliest grant makers to SASB um, and and they have held true to that mission right of, of providing uh, everyone in the investment landscape with guidance on what are the most material ESG issues across 77 different subsectors so you can start right there in terms of uh, you know get, um, getting a hold of your narrative look at what have how industry experts across the value chain have contributed to this SASB's materiality map and through you know several consultations they've come up with a distilled version of the most material issues so you being able to as a you I mean as a corporate being able to understand uh, what those issues are how it might be uh, pertinent to your business because if some of it may not be you may have very idiosyncratic choices that make you different from the industry or subsector you are in, uh, but then being able to provide disclosure to give comfort to investors that you are mitigating the risks and capturing the opportunities from this ESG issue uh, is I think is I think how, um, how I kind of see this space evolving. Yeah, I want to just add two aspects. Uh, I I really like to follow Nikita because she covers <laughs> the issue uh, perfectly. Uh, two complications. Uh, great fan. We are great fans of SASB too. Uh, I, it's one of the greatest contributions in this whole landscape of evolution of uh, coming to grips with, with sustainability information relevant for finance. Two complications, two increasingly occur. One is one has to increasingly also focus on the value and supply chain for many companies. That's why uh, where many unlisted companies are usually in. And this is why the focus on the value chain is, is very key too, as a complementary tool to, to shed light on where do we stand. It's unavoidable. Uh, it can be a very positive experience if done in the right way, combined with capacity building and uh, positive drivers, value drivers, technology shifts. And the other one is industry coupling. As we are moving into a decarbonized world, increasingly we see new collaborations happening, say between automotive and utilities. Yeah. So you have different sectors now uh, finding new solutions. Yeah. Or if you look at the, some new mega projects that are coming up on hydrogen, yeah, the consortia of companies involved comes from many walks of life and different uh, backgrounds and sectors. So there's uh, quite some dynamics uh, in the uh, an analysis, so to speak. Yeah. It's not always just that easy. Old. Actually, I'm almost inclined to argue that because of technological change and its rapid pace, and because of the transformations we are uh, seeing witnessing now, we will need at some point uh, uh, also more flexible industry sector definition. Uh, uh, but maybe the taxonomy for that is just fine. Uh, but we have to be multi-sector uh, mind open, so to speak, and uh, as an added uh, point but otherwise i think it's absolutely correct you start with what your core business is you look into what is my most material footprint you analyze it in relationship to the context where you operate how your environment is evolving if you're a globally company obviously it's more complex you have different markets if you operate primarily in one market it's relatively easier but still through your value chain you probably have many other links and exposures, risks and opportunities that need to be covered as well. I would just add that these considerations definitely, you know, bringing it back to the mobilization of capital, banks are watching and they're rewarding borrowers that are lowering their carbon footprint. Um, so this lending is also helping banks meet their, their green investing targets. Um, so when you think about kind of how companies and financial institutions, corporates, especially across the energy, transportation, and industrial sectors, how they're organizing internally has um, financial implications to their access to capital as well. Right. It's a very good point, um, Alexa. And I think, you know, given we only have one minute left here, I'd love to just answer one final question um, from, from an anonymous attendee. And Georg, this is gonna go towards you. So climate risk lends itself to quantitative and perhaps more objective analysis. 
how are we doing on social characteristics? Sorry, are we doing? How are we doing on social characteristics? Uh, not as well. Uh, quantification is far more difficult. Human capital is very hard to, to quantify. <laughs> uh, many efforts have been made and maybe a solution will come soon. Uh, how do you assess human capital? Uh, we have insights. We know what corporate culture means. That's how important it is. Um, but to quanti we are not yet there. On some of the social issues, we, have, we are weak. Uh, I think there's also a fundamental point that corporate responsibility versus social issues in its own domain where it controls matters is 100%. But in many of the systemic challenges we are facing, be it on education or healthcare, it is also primarily a public policy issue. And that's where your first point is so important. It is very appropriate for CEOs in this new era to speak up for the public good, so to speak, and to lend voice to strengthen public policies that are necessary to address some of these public goods notions where policy is the overarching uh, shaping factor. Corporates can make a difference bottom up, but talking about systemic uh, solutions, you need shifts in public policy making. And that's where corporate statesmanship or, or uh, stewardship notions are very important. Absolutely. And I mean, I think we're going to see over the next few years, the, the US mirroring in some ways um, what Europe is leading on in terms of public policy. And I think that really just wraps up our session perfectly. You know, thinking about ESG as a collective responsibility and, and really just urging companies to take control of the ESG data that they share with the market. Um, and so with that, you know, I'd like to really just thank Alexa, Nikita, and Georg for joining us here today. This is the first part of four in our um, 2021 Sustainable Finance Series. We hope to see you on the next three. Um, shortly, you'll see a little poll pop up on the screen um, asking how you enjoyed the session today. And we will see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.